my session on reliably well architected. It's very different to all the other sessions. So if you actually went to Irfan's session a little earlier in this room about reliability in AKS, so that was very specific one type of workload in the cloud being Kubernetes services, this is the general track. So this is where you will understand what it means, how it means. I will go into definitions. Okay, so what? It, so when you're trying to understand and come up with a plan, that plan has got to be backed by something you can measure. Otherwise, you don't know what it is. If you're not measuring it and you know how to measure it, then it's a plan that's built to fail. Okay, so I want to test this. Does it work? Cool, it does, thank you. Two key concepts, reliability and resilience. So reliability really is just you know, how it performs well. You, know? you have a service, whatever that might be, is it running? Is it running when it's supposed to be running? And the other one is resilience. How does that service withstand when something doesn't go right? If something goes wrong, how does it withstand it? So, Reliability is the what, and resilience is the how. Keep those in mind. So what it's doing, and how is it going to recover? And I'll go through those as we go through there. Now, everyone talks about this. We're not the only cloud provider in the world, and everyone has figures. And I would be amiss if I didn't come up with a figure too. <laughs> what is our figure? So here we go. Single instance VM uptime in Australia East, so here in... Sydney, that's our uptime. Okay, so anyone wants to figure out what the downtime that is? What's the opposite of uptime is downtime? What's the um, downtime for that in, let's do it in minutes. Anyone? There's a website, uptime.is. Yeah. It's two minutes a year. That's what that SLA means. Okay, so that's our uptime. But there's a bit of a difference on how we um, define our uptime. So, but you know, like, what does it mean? You know, that's what it is for the whole month. Doesn't mean that's the whole for the whole year. Okay, on, in February, sorry, in January, that figure would have been different. Okay. But uh, just be mindful that this is the uptime, and then we go to the next level, which is service level agreement. So the Microsoft Cloud will provide you a 99.95. SLA, service level agreement, and the difference between uptime and service level agreement is the service level agreement from Microsoft is financially backed. If we don't meet it, we will credit your account back with the money for the, for the, the period we don't meet the SLA. So it's in the terms of conditions. So when you buy a VM and you configure it accordingly, it's backed by that financial SLA. They're all available publicly. I uh, don't expect everyone to go downloading. It's a big Word document now with all the SLAs in one thing. So, yeah, if, if you're doing it and your lawyers need it, grab it. Here you go, legal team. Read it. It's not our thing to do. Okay, but putting these things together comes in three parts. You need a foundation, and that's what the Microsoft Cloud provides you. The foundation to go and build what you want and how you want it. There's extra resiliency services, and it says here optional, but I don't say most of them are optional. Optional capabilities to use to make sure that your solution is resilient and able to recover, and then your app goes on top of it. Now, I'm gonna provide a clear delineation. Microsoft's responsibility of the cloud is the, the platform itself, okay? We are responsible and we provide all our SLAs here clearly defined legal terms, which I don't read, okay? So we put it there, we operate it, and we make sure that it's there. The customer's responsibility is the top two. We provide the features. You don't have to use them, okay? I'm sure there are solutions that don't even back up their data. Yes, it's as horrible as it sounds, yeah, okay, I won't say anything, people in, a dev environment may not want to back up their data, but in a prod, if you're not doing it, then you'll, you know, yes. Yes, it's available, you don't use it, but it's, it is your responsibility being in the cloud to 
use those features. So the key takeaway, it's a shared responsibility. Okay, Just like you've got the other shared responsibility model in IaaS, PaaS, SaaS, now this one's for building resilient applications. We provide it and we like to make sure that they are used and used properly. Okay, I'll work my way up from the bottom. What does it mean for Microsoft to provide a resilient cloud for everyone to use? So what do we do? We have geographies. Now, um, they're different to regions and I'll go into it. A geography is a combination of multiple regions together. Now, Australia happens to be a geography. Okay, at the moment, we've got Australia East, Australia Southeast. But, you know, there's New Zealand coming along as well. Okay, that will be announced soon. We've already announced the data center is coming. The actual go live date will be, um, I believe, sometime this year. Fingers are crossed that you know, it all goes to plan. Yeah, so that's a geography. They're usually in pairs. Not necessarily. Uh, anyone here from Brazil? Yay, hi, how are you? Uh, your region is paired with a, a, a data center in the US. Okay, so, it, okay, there are exceptions. That was the, the most common one that I, I like to say. So you have these regions and they use, and they're um, like this. And this example deliberately built it this way because this is exactly how Sydney, so Australia East, Australia Southeast, because availability zones are available here, and down in Australia Southeast, Melbourne, they're not there. So important to know that there's a little difference, and I'll go into this. So we have geographies. Okay? Now that comes important in your DR strategy on storage. Okay? Because storage is always paired within its geography, except for Brazil. So it's always paired there. So if you are doing storage on GRS or ZA, so GRS, any of them, it'll be replicated geographically to its pair. So Australia East will be replicated to Australia Southeast. Okay, that's the built-in replication. There is no other choice. So you, okay. So if you have, you want to control it yourself you'll have to come up with a different approach, maybe um, doing an AZ copy against source to destination, because you, let's just hypothetically say you don't like Australia Southeast, you wanted to move it to Singapore, for example. Okay. So if you wanna take advantage of the geographies, that's built in, just enable GRS, geo-redundant storage, and that will do it for you, okay? Disaster recovery. Oh, yeah. So does that, is it the same region or like, how does that work? For, uh, that's a good question. I'll, I'll repeat the question, but I'll keep the mic closer for the next time. So disaster recovery is always in the same region and you have the flexibility to design it which way you like. So the, the, if you want to do a lot of the offloading of the complexity, and let it be done by the platform, then Australia Southeast is the, the right candidate for workloads in Australia South Australia East. So Sydney to Melbourne. Okay. So if there's a disaster in Sydney and you've turned on geo replication of your storage, then the storage has been copied to Melbourne. So it just makes sense to that way. So it yeah. stays within the geography. The, you can send it yeah. if you do it yourself. Okay, so that's again, do you want to make the tool or do you want to use the platform feature? Again, that's, if I go back a few earlier, it's an optional feature. Do you want to use GRS? Yeah. You don't have to, because there might be storage that you don't care, it's transient. If you lose it, there's no loss of business value. Okay? As an architect, you'll decide some data is important, some is just purely transient. And I, if there's a loss, okay, so be it, there's a loss. It might have a small impact on user experience. That means, like for example, they're doing a search on a website for some products in an e-commerce platform, and you've cached those results against the user's session, and you're putting it into a false storage. Data warehouse. Data warehouse. Yes. There's data. There's value. 
you'll need a backup of it, and etc. So yeah, the use case depends. So we go to regions. So we have two commercial regions in Australia. So that's Australia East and Australia South East. Sydney, Melbourne again. They're the same. Sydney happens to be one with availability zones and is quite uh, interesting. Um, data centers within a region, there are not just one, there's multiple. So if we just say that Australia East, so the Sydney region, how many data centers are there? Does anyone know? I, I don't even know. <laughs> Canberra's different. <laughs> Canberra data centers, two seed, more reserved for federal. Clients, but yes, there's yeah, there's lots of data centers here, and we're building another one. Okay, so we keep so multiple data centers. So don't you think it's just one data center, one physical building? There's multiple of them that come together to make Sydney. Okay, and there are limits, which um, I don't remember if I left it in here. There's limits to the distance because we guarantee synchronous replication within the region. Therefore, there's a limit because there's a speed of lights going between the two data centers. And synchronous commits, if anyone's a DBA here, will know you need synchronous commits to be as short time as possible. So our guide, uh, did I? I do, I have it in the next one. Um, our guide to our commit times for distance between the data centers is um, driven by our commitment to that time period of trying to get. So that's actually in this slide here. Down there. Here we are. I thought I could I, I write it down. So we make sure that these commits are met down the bottom. So that dictates how far apart we can put our data centers. So if people start asking, oh, you know, you got one, let's say one in this building hypothetically, how far away is your next one? Well, they're all roughly within that um, uh, period of time. So within the availability zone, okay. so yeah, again, more, could be more than one data center in availability zone. So no more than 40 kilometers here. And between these ones, inter, no more than 120. Local, luckily for the ones all in, in Sydney are within 120, they are spread out. So. Um, don't think they're all just in one little area in case a disaster happens and knocks out two. They're, they're ge geographically spread out. Okay, so the platform gives you the ability for to use these. Yes, question? Yeah, um, an availability zone. Uh, put it in the mic so people who watch the recording can see, can hear it. Yeah, um, within an availability zone, the um, power and calling is always redundant, right? Correct. Completely separate. And it may be across two data centers to achieve that. Correct. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's so right. every data center has at least two separate power feeds. Yeah. And every data center has multiple cooling racks. Thanks, Sam. Uh, multiple cooling racks. And each, again, has um, different approaches. So the cooling halls, okay, each, cool, each hall does anyone know? Who's a data center person? I'm going into data center design. So think of a hall is just a enclosed room with lots of racks in it, and then there's a hallway in between it, and there's another hall which has another set of racks, and then another hallway. So each area, each hall of racks, so you know, you've got racks and servers, so each hall has redundant power supply, power, the top of switch, the top of rack switches are also redundant because it's top and bottom. Dual power feeds, bottom and top. So everything is at least dual. So correct. It's very well over-engineered. And the uh, whole idea of that is that if something does happen to one, it can be uh, like it's enough to be able to move into another. There's another concept which I didn't go into here called fault domains and update domains. So the specific one about power is a fault. So that's where these dual and multiple redundant power and aircon comes into play. When there's a fault in a rack or a, or a collection of racks, they're able to then tell 
you know, at the hype of, this is in the fabric level at the, at the bottom, to move your workload, almost like a V motion. I won't say V motion because it's not v, VMware, it's Hyper V. It's able to move your workload. Um, obviously, there are limitations if you're using a big M128 or 512 series VM, SAP workloads. There's no way you're going to move four terabytes of RAM in a matter of milliseconds. So there are laws of physics involved. But in small workloads, those are usually within within 100 milliseconds to a one second. The workload, there might be a little blip, transient thing happen on your workload, but um, more often than not, your workload won't notice that it's been moved from one rack to another. Yeah, depths of data center design, and I'm not a data center person. I'm actually an app person. So, <laughs> good question. Another um, question? Yeah, yeah uh, hello. Uh, I want to know why uh, some region doesn't does some region don't support AZ. So historically, we all started with just regions with update and fault domains, okay? and AZ started coming um, because we started getting more and more requirements for greater resilience. So update and fault domains only started providing 99.5 up to 99.9% reliability and our SLAs were a little little lower or they were that at that level so they were low when more and more mission critical workloads coming started coming onto the platform those customers were saying you know our regulator or our industry regulations need us to be mission critical what can we do on the platform is mission critical so Microsoft took it onto itself and started building Availability zones in all, not every region. It started going the US, Europe, Singapore, that's a massive one, the, um, uh, West, East US. Even now, we just made a massive announcement for uh, Sweden Central. That's a massive AZ. And that's, you know, if, if you're doing AI, you deploy your open AI instance in Sweden, you'll find it much faster than Australia East because it's a massive data center that just got open. So it's just historic. We started with just regions and I just, can I, I'll go back to the old slide. We just started with regions which were non-AZ aware and we've just improved to offer that greater reliability. So it's just historic. Good question. Okay. Okay, now we move on. What is the customer's responsibility in the cloud? And that is, yeah, this slide. What do you do to make your application reliable? So let's look at the resiliency features and then I'll work up to work uh, to the app itself. So let's go, what can you do for storage? Okay, so multiple types of storage, locally redundant. Three copies within each data center. Okay. You only pay for one, but it's three. Okay. The, the call it resiliency is these 11 nines. And I know one of our major competitors also uses that and says, oh, ours is 16 nines. Yeah, yeah, so is ours on that end. If you, if you compare like for like, please. It's, it's, so please don't look at the LRS lots of nines there's an actual financial SLA behind it. So if you're creating an SLA or in a true system, it'd be a composite SLA, yeah, take the financial SLA, because that way, if something goes wrong, Microsoft will credit you that amount for, for the time it's out of here. So that's within, and that's the cheapest storage option. Okay, so three copies in your data center. Next one up is ZRS, okay? So it provides the durability across the availability zones. So that means there's nine, take this, nine copies of your data. Okay. Okay, yes, you pay for three, but you got nine. So it costs, but you well, actually you're not paying for three, you're paying for two. It's actually cheaper. It works out to be cheaper. But um, again, yeah. and the next one LRS has three copies. In the same data center, okay. So in, inside the, the data center, you'll have three copies. Azure is responsible for making sure those copies are synchronized. 
from your perspective, as in a builder of an app, and you're looking at Azure storage, blob storage, you're using the SDK, you're writing to blob storage, you're none the wiser. To you, it's one copy of the data in and out. Yeah. But to the platform, it's three. Question? Why, why does the picture only show two? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give the socks out now? <laughs> uh, yeah, you've got the socks. There you go. If there's another question, do I have to give one sock to the other person? <laughs> <laughs> that was the best one. Thank you. Yes. I don't know. Oh, I must have lost. <laughs> I must have forgotten it. Yeah. Three. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Last one, GRS. So geo redundant storage so you have your copy and and it's also replicated to melbourne okay so city of melbourne is a good example here now again there is greater cost there's also another option called ra grs because if you just configure this by the by default read and write not viewable turn on ra read access read only so fully read write readable okay as your problem you read and write, you write something here it'll be asynchronously copied to, to the other region your workload is totally unaware okay it goes across there so that's one of the that's the storage resiliency options Now we're going to compute. So we have these types of compute by I'll call VMs here. So we have single VMs, okay, and we can give you an S SLA of 99.9 .9 when you're using premium storage on that VM just by itself. You don't have to worry about anything, just let it run, and that's the SLA we guarantee against it. Now, if you start using availability sets, I'm skipping fault domains. And those, I'll go straight to availability sets. Okay, next one up, 99.95. Just be mindful in the availability set, you've got to have multiple VMs. Please don't just use one, please. My guidance is multiples of three. Why? Because then you're putting it into a availability set in the, in the zone and you're getting the extra digit. So going to 99.99, so four nines already. Just three VMs in availability zone. Okay, that's the next one. And the, obviously the, the, the bee's knees, the last one. An entire region being deployed. If it's, if it's Sydney, then you'll have this topology deployed in Sydney with failover. So your storage is replicated. You have Azure Site Recovery, which is the tool to back up put them into backup vaults and then duplicate the backup vault from the primary region to the secondary region. And then you're able to actually orchestrate the recovery in the secondary region. And Azure Site Recovery can actually control the backup plan and recovery plan. So if you need to start up domain controllers before your SQL servers, before your web server, recovery services can do that as well. It can orchestrate to make sure your domain controllers come up because I know I used to be a DBA and an apps dev person. You need your domain controllers because the SQL server is running a domain account. Okay, it's, in, it's a domain. So when the, when the server comes up, SQL server, it's gonna run the SQL server service. The account has to be validated against the domain controller and needs a Kerberos ticket. So it needs to contact the domain controller. If that doesn't happen, then SQL server service will just sit there and you'll see all these things in your Windows event log. So there's an orchestration you need. Site recovery will do it for you. Okay, this is very infrastructure focused, this slide. Another question. God, this guy, Sorry, come yeah. to the front. Um, <laughs> Sorry, do you need, is, do you have to order a GRS SKU as part of the right-hand side there? Say that question again. Do you have to order a, a, GR, a GRS? Yeah, zero redundant storage? Yeah, um, as part of, the Azure Site Recovery Services? Yeah, you would put them together in plan. So site recovery is specifically around virtual machine recovery. Okay. But it, but you can also put your site, your data into that backup vault. 
okay, but so separate thing. yeah, it's separate. Yep. Okay, so geo redundant storage is a built in capability of storage. Site recovery is not a built in capability of virtual machines. It's an extra optional service you can use. You can just back up your VMs in the same region. But if the region goes down, you can't do anything. So that's why if you need multi-region, that's you need site recovery to another region. So when you go to that model, obviously that's the big knees. But then you're looking at mission critical workloads. So if you're a FSI or a, like a, a one of the big retail custom, uh, um, companies here, yeah, you'll be running either one of these patterns or even there's, an, there's another pattern called mission critical pattern, which is multi-region as active. Your architecture starts to change a bit there. And that's, yeah, and I do go into it a little later. I'll, I'll just, I'll come back to it later. Okay, so app services. We're all apps developers. How do we use the app services? Because you know, computers and VMs and servers are for the infra people. Us app people like app services. So what's available? So you, the basic tier, you know, three and a half nines. Okay, so basic SKU, as it's called, the, the tier, is a non-zonal deployment, okay? It's, there is a free tier, great for development, but when you're putting something in a production environment, basic is the absolute minimum. Okay? Even, um, most customers don't use basic in production. Most customers, oops, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Most customers use premium. So, yes, correct. So, what, what, if you remember what Regina was saying earlier, if you templatize this, your environment is just a template variable. So you can say, please deploy me my application in prod. So I'll go and find what prod is and deploy everything in the prod subscription. If you're doing this in a SIT environment, SIT belongs to another subscription, goes and deploys with SIT. So you, you certainly can. So minimum instance is one. Great for you know, testing. So UAT, SIT is great on this thing not for production. Premium, V2 or V3, do prefer V3, better um, computing power for your money. Greater SLA, and also gives you the, the ability for zone redundant. So, for, so you can get this in Australia East. So get it. Um, we do recommend that you turn on the availability zones and putting three, why three? Question, very simple answer. If one go, one zone goes down, if you've got three, let's say availability zone one goes down, you have two and three available. So you're only reducing your compute capability by one third. You're spreading your risk across multiple regions. And the last one, the app service environment. Now, this is a, a better environment. It's more dedicated, so the compute of ASC, as we call it, is dedicated, but it's also VNet injected. Large organizations have still um, workloads that are sitting in private networks, whether that private network's in a data center or on-prem, so some people still have some background servers. This is able to then grab directly to it and it's uh, obviously, as Sam was alluding, but keeping very quiet, it's the most costly option, okay? Yeah, yeah. Not yet, I'll get there, because yes, cost is a factor. As an architect, are you, if your solution costs a million dollars a month to run, but you're only making 100,000 for the company, then it's not a solution. Interestingly, it's like a virtual machine. So if you enable the availability zone on it, you pay three times. Yes, okay, so it's not, yeah, correct. Minimum instance of three is on that one. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, but because it's dedicated, you also can get greater density. Okay, so you, the trade off is you're getting better density. Okay? There's a limit to the amount of density, in other words, the number of apps you should be running in an app service plan. Over here, it's higher because the compute power you're getting is greater compute. 
So trade-offs as an architect. No? Okay, so let's compute. Of course, we have databases. You know, all there's no app without a database. And so, you know, we, obviously, we have our traditional Azure SQL. We have SQL and managed instance SQL. There are differences with them. I won't go into them for this talk. But we also do have Postgres, MySQL, and MariaDB available as well. So, take your pick on which um, DBMS technology you want. But we also have, and my favorite, is Cosmos DB. So these, Cosmos is a NoSQL engine. Okay, and the beauty about uh, my, uh, Cosmos, it's global, so it can be distributed. It also gives you the ability to have multi-master rights. Okay, so if you are looking at a true global database, and I know one of my um, previous customers is using it, they have, Instances in Australia, Japan, Europe, all running as master. So if any one region goes down, they can just say, okay, Australia is gone, but my other two regions are still readable and writable, and they just then spin up in the environment in Singapore. So Singapore becomes the Azure deployment that runs Australia. Something goes wrong with Japan, yeah, they'll spin it up in Singapore. And then there you go. So that's, their, but they're mission critical. So you have the ability, you don't have to use. Again, this is one of your little tools in your toolbox you can use. What if I want to use multiple database, like for logging? And yeah, so what if I want to use multiple database instances, like for logging, I want to use Postgre. Uh, for SQL database, you know, for operational data store, we have, you know, I want to use SQL database. Maybe for data warehouse, I don't, I haven't used Cosmos, but I'm just going for Cosmos because of what you said. So, how to manage like different database instances in just one world? Yeah. Yeah. So, how you manage them is all through the Azure portal. You have that one single pane of glass, and you can also, if you're really more advanced, you can use um, infrastructure as code. Okay, so, you can do that. Now, at a Business user layer, still it's a UI. Someone's built a UI. And the layer in between, which is you know, level two and three of support, which is usually the apps dev team, um, you have access to Azure SQL and SQL managed distance through SSM, uh, SSMS. Okay. Cosmos DB has, um, there are UIs to build, and there is one directly in the Azure portal. It's called Data Explorer underneath Cosmos DB. And you can actually go into it, into the databases inside the account. Then open that, you have the collections. Collection is like a table. It's a collection over here, and it's a table over here. Okay, one sort of it's closest. And you can manage them there. They have different use cases. Very different use cases. Okay. Um, that's NoSQL. If you're using NoSQL, Cosmos. There are other competitor products for NoSQL. AWS has the, GCP has them. Yeah. So most modern apps use a NoSQL database. Doesn't mean that SQL is the, is being discarded. There are still lots of apps using Azure SQL. Okay. So fully managed. So that means the reliability. It's taken off your shoulders. There's no burden on you to do it. Now, what do you need to do? Okay, well, your app at the top. Okay, so let's start looking at some stuff at the top of there. Is your app resilient? Okay, common question, and this is how I start talking to customers. What do we do? Your front end here. Is it stateless, especially for its tokens? Because you know you don't want to be storing your token in the front end for your user, because you know, users are authorized. That token should never be there. So in other words, the old golden rule of stateless web services. And that web service could be a UI, could be an API. Stateless comes into play. Okay, that that design paradigm hasn't gone away. So that's important. Okay, so there's nothing reliant at this layer. Next one we start talking about is your app tier. Your app 
is talking to the databases, but what happens if one of the databases has to fail over? How well does your app support the failover and the recoverability? Okay. So I'm actually having this discussion right now with another large customer that they did this failover test. Okay. Sydney to Melbourne, Azure SQL. Okay. Their app, for some reason, was still trying to connect to Sydney, even though Sydney was dead. They Because you can actually, with Azure SQL, you can force the failover. It's part of the feature of the platform when you want to do your DR testing. Their app was still talking to Sydney, even though Sydney was dead. Yeah, a bit of downtime. It, it, they, you know, it took them 15 minutes to figure all this out. And we're, but they were doing this obviously late at night and and trying to simulate because they wanted to do the DR testing before it actually happened on the platform. Okay, so it's also important as a um, recovery plan is what actions you take. There's a whole article from one of my colleagues, actually two, Scott McKinnon and Rolf Tesma wrote a massive article on disaster DR recovery for data, okay? What do you do? What actions can you take, okay? And one of the, f the first actions is do nothing. Wait for Microsoft to do everything for you. Because Scott came from a large banking organization where it took him, and he made this claim to a lot of people, that it took half a day just to organize the war room to respond to a DR event. But the DR issue that was transiting the platform recovered within an hour. So does it, is it worth your effort as an organization to, to set that up or wait for Microsoft? So Scott and Rolf went through all these different variants and documented it. So have a look it up uh, on our, it's on our architecture site on that, those. They're very important for, that, for DB disaster recovery because ultimately all our information resides in some kind of database some storage. So does your app tier recover and your data tier? You know, is it replicating? Because if your data is not replicating and the region goes out, well, you, know, you just got to have to wait for the region to come back up online. You know, there'll be data loss. So what do you do here? Lots of questions. Just remember the responsibility. Yeah. Who has the responsibility when? OK. So I know someone in the morning asked for patterns. Uh, I don't think the person's here. Hmm? Yeah, someone asked for patterns. Someone wanted to know reference architectures. Yeah, so yeah. it's all right. Here's uh, one of the patterns here. It's obviously taking advantage of the fault domains, uh, being very careful. So you have the fault domain availability set on the SQL Server going across, and the IIS. Now, this is very infra-focused, infra but this pattern will give you 99.95 SLA. So there is a four and a half hours downtime per year on this one. Okay. So it's a great pattern. It's a starting point, especially if um, looking, because you're only really running four virtual machines. Yeah. What does it look like in an actual implementation? So, getting a bit more technical. For those who know, there's an app gateway. So, app gateway, layer seven load balancer, also provides web application firewall to counter the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. It does it at this point. Coming in to your availability set, and those VMs are inside the availability set, NSG, network security group, to only allow I traffic from the app gateway in, and then that pattern repeats. A load balancer, allowing traffic in from the web tier into the business tier, another availability set with multiple VMs. And the same with SQL. Okay, inside availability set, primary and secondary for, as the failover, and you do need cloud a witness. Now that witness could be storage, which is the cheapest option, or you can have another SQL server, a bit more expensive because you need to pay for the license. So keep it that way. And obviously down here, as I said, you do need your domain service, otherwise you know, very common fault. 
where the SQL servers come up and something doesn't go right. Now, next level. Introducing availability zones. If we introduce availability zones, look at the SLA. Okay, again, we're going up one more digit. That's now less than an hour of downtime per year. So all we've done instead of going availability sets, which is within a region in the older model, so um, Australia Southeast, if we're using in Sydney, we're going into extra model. So we're using availability zones. Okay, now, how different does that look? It doesn't. It doesn't look different except for this against across different zones. That's it. So technically, there's no difference. Cost, there's no difference on these. There is a cost extra for this, yeah, because the zone redundant gateway costs a bit more. But all this is exactly the same. So the cost. So going from four and a half hours downtime to two hours downtime, the only real difference in the cost is just this extra gateway at the front to be zone redundant. Now, we're app developers. I hate infrastructure. Let's go. What does it look like? Oh, Christian, sorry. Sorry. Here, uh, what is the difference between using an Azure front door rather than a zone redundant application? Gateway? Yeah, good question. Now, a front door can do the same as... Uh, um, application gateway but front door is a global service so I think it's on every single edge zone so it's not 60 regions there's many more edge zones so there's about 200 around the world so what will so, be the cost difference okay so the cost difference is that front door is again like um, app gateway there's a charge per usage so per megabyte but what actually also does happen is it has a built-in CDN, a content delivery network. So when you turn that on in front door, it's gonna cache a lot of your information. So images is a great example that are coming off your VMs. It'll cache them all around the locations around the world. There's a cost to grabbing that information in and out of your VMs. So you're gonna be charged for that. Okay, it's great. Your users get a better experience because if your users in West US somewhere, let's say Los Angeles, those images will be served from the point of presence in West US rather than all the way back to Australia. So because that distance is a 500 millisecond travel time. So great. So, the difference technically is, is just really that. This um, app gateway, always in a region. Okay, so this app gateway you deploy in Sydney, that's it, it's in Sydney. Whereas front door is global, it's all around the world. It has implications as well on your health probes. So your health probes from this to here to make sure it knows that everything's up and running. All your health probe information will be coming this in and out here to this. So it all stay within this virtual network. Whereas front door probes, cause you'll have 200 of them hitting your service. So now these will be getting 200 different requests because the West US is saying, are you healthy? Are you healthy? Are you healthy? It will be just keep asking because it needs to know. No, do I send my traffic to who? So, so there's an extra elevated volume of traffic, but you're getting a compensating action of that being global. Look. So you're looking at, are you look, is your app meant to be global? or you're just a regional app just for this local market. Thanks. So they still do load, layer seven load balancing. They still have private connectivity. So front door can um, connect to a, a, an IP, a private link to go into your private network. You can do that. It just, it depends on your solution. Global reach, non-global reach. Um, if there's gonna be that extra load or not. I'm just mindful of time. So, as I said, I hate infrastructure. I shouldn't say that too loud, but because I do know. But yeah. I'm an apps person as well. Now, uh, someone was asking earlier today, they wanted to see baseline reference architectures. Uh, this is it for zone redundant web apps. 
So again, it's only when done an app gateway coming to a private endpoint, there's the app service against three zones. And then it needs to be VNet injected to be able to talk to endpoints to talk to these services. So the architecture looks different, but this is now what you're looking for. This is the baseline uh, app service. I didn't put in the app service environment because as, as Sam was alluding, it's a bit more of an expensive architecture and it's something for larger enterprises to consider rather than just normal, uh, normal organizations. So we see this more, co more common. How do I know I've been reliably architected? Oh, was there a question? Sorry, yes, come. If a region specific um, downtime happened at the application gateway, how do we manage with this zone redundant one? So if it's at a region level, yeah. so yeah, so the whole region would down because the zone, the gateway as well will be also down. Yeah. How so, you do that one is you put in an app, uh, a front door in front of it. Okay, yeah, so, so the means, front door will be pointing to your public IP of your app gateway. Okay, so, so front door in front of the, uh, I mean, front of the application gateway, as you are saying. Yeah, or you can do, I should have said this is a cheaper option, is Azure Traffic Manager. So Azure Traffic Manager, because it'll just do DNS routing and it has um, weighted routing and performance routing. So if you pick the performance routing, how long and how slow it is, it will eventually detect because it does its probes at an interval, it will eventually detect there's something wrong with region one and then move over to region two. Now, again, depends. If you're architecting this as mission critical, okay, you'll never have an active cold standby. You'll have active, active. You have multiple regions running at the same time and your user will always be directed to the closest one. Reason for closest one is user experience. Okay, you know that the general rule, if someone waits more than five or so seconds at a website, they give up and go somewhere else. So the closer you bring your images, your compute to the user, better performance, better experience, better customer satisfaction. So these are the factors to weigh up. Yeah. Okay. So how do you know you're well architected? Well, the well architected framework, it goes through Five pillars, and there's the shortcut link, akday.ms well architected slash framework. And reliability is the pillar under there's a whole bunch of information in there. To look at design level as well. So we have two frameworks: cloud adoption framework, and we have well architected framework. Okay? Cloud adoption is really for your journey into the cloud. And as you're doing your journey in the cloud, you go back and check what and how should I be doing things? Have I looked at security? Have I looked at governance? Okay. It gives you the forward, forward thinking ideas. Then you go to well architected and it gives you the backward looking ideas. Have you put in the right NSGs and security controls in place? Have you the, so Think of them coming together. Don't use one without the other. Use both. If one's too much reading, go have a coffee, come back and read it again. Because never give them never give up on them. So you have reliability. Okay, that's great. What do we do? And I'll give you a quick rundown on some of these because um, these do take a long time. They come under three categories: design, testing, and monitoring. Have you designed it well? And you look at these things, so they're obviously quite important. Your availability, you know, what is the SLA you're trying to achieve from your business? Please, as technical people, don't drive the SLA. Ask your business, who's the product owner of the solution you're building? What is their expectation? Because they'll say uptime all the time, okay? Yeah. yeah, and then you'll counter them with, okay, it'll cost, and you'll come through these, okay? And then how do you measure it? Okay, and then how do you make sure you're right? Chaos engineering and injecting your faults. And then making sure you're monitoring because you need to be monitoring because something goes wrong, you need to be on top of it. You don't want people to go backwards. So these are things I'll go into. Them. First one, design. What are there to, what's there to learn? 
You need to be able to measure and get to a thing called SLA. We all hear this one. But how do you get to it? First one is the service indicator. It's the measurement. Okay, good example. What percentage are under five seconds? Okay, you need to know how to measure. Because you don't measure, you can't build up an SLA. Next one is the target. It's called an SLO. Okay, I want 99% to be under five seconds within the last hour. Okay, okay. I'm measuring. What's the objective? And only then you can come up with an agreement. Okay, because look, the agreement has all this stuff in there. You need to, be, what are you measuring? What period? And this is what you're going to tell your business you're getting there. Okay. I've seen a lot of customers interchange these. Okay. Just be careful. SLI is a measurement, just one measurement. Okay. SLA is lots of them because you're providing, and they are composite SLAs. Okay. So there's a whole formula around it. So if you go to the World Architecture Framework, um, and, and the cloud adoption, it'll tell you how to use those formulas to come up with a composite SLA. But as I just said, go to your business owner and product owner and ask them, and they always want 100% uptime. <sighs> how many times have I seen this? They want 99, yeah. The cost and complexity goes through the roof. Okay. If the solution costs you a million dollars a month to run and you're only making 100,000, that it's not a solution. Okay? There's no point in going building something incredibly complex and that phenomenal SLA if there's no return on investment. The business will go bankrupt. End of story. Uh, it won't justify it. So take the SLAs that they ask for and come up with calculations and come up with sample architectures and cost them. Because then they'll realize never going down costs literally will cost millions a month. Okay? People don't, can't afford it. Okay. So while you're coming with that architecture to come with the price, do this. Understand which component will break and how will it break. It's called failure mode analysis. And this is the first step of chaos engineering. Okay. okay. It's something done at the beginning. So architects will consider this and come up with it. And this is the process you go through. Finding what's in the system. For each component, come up with a map of all the potential failures and risk them. You know, what's the risk of it? If this thing happens and it fails, what's the risk onto the solution and onto the business? Come up with all these and then how will the app respond? Do read on this some chaos engineering, okay, and also our architecture center has reference on there. But I've been working with a customer who's been doing a lot of work on chaos engineering and introducing it into their applications. So this is a sample, and I have worked with, on this one, and this is what an FMA would look like. The component, the risk, the likelihood, and what mitigation steps you write there. So I'll do container registry, because if, any, if you followed Ifan's stuff on reliable AKS, if you don't have your container registry available, what would happen? Because your image is in the container registry. Service outage, likely low because there's an SLA on, on that. What would happen? The applications will continue to run, but if a new pod needs to start on a node that doesn't have the image, it will not start. You will get an error, image pull error, and won't run. This, this is, no, no, this is still technical. This is, this sample can be applied to any domain, retail, FSI, any industry vertical. Okay. So this is now at a technology fault layer. So this, what would, so. Organic change based on the Yes, this part. Okay. This is, I've made this as generic as possible to apply to every possible domain I can think of for this presentation to make it generic because I know people will be taking photos of it. This is a very good sample that i um, worked on. Okay, something goes wrong with container registry, potential downstream impacts. Uh, look, you can see most of it is no. Yeah. 
But for your application, it might be very high. Right? So don't look at container registry. This could be Azure SQL. So again, you'll do the same thing, component. Azure SQL, the risk. Service outage. So Azure SQL goes out in all regions. What happens? Okay, the likelihood is low because Azure SQL has a SLA of 99.95. Okay, so what's that downtime? Two hours per year. Okay, so likelihood is low. If it did go down, what would happen to your application? Okay, so it's component specific and then solution specific. This is a great template. It, 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 use it for critical, use it for any application. Okay? So this is the first tenant of chaos engineering, understanding the faults that can happen to your system. So we'll go into testing for reliability, great segue, is it's all in good and well said. Things are there, they're running, but you don't want to wait for a failure to find out how well this solution works. You need to test it. The onus is on you to go back and test it, come up with a, a, a plan, execute it. If it works well, massive green tick. If it doesn't work well, take the learnings and implement them again. So as I said, one of my customers did a DR plan for SQL failover from Sydney to Melbourne, but their app was still running and pointing over to Sydney even though Sydney was dead. Lesson learnt, something's wrong with the app. Okay, so they've got a, they put into their DR drill, do extra connection, extra testing to make sure this doesn't happen and they've put it in there. Now they're going back and looking into the source code and why, how, and trying to de, you know, disassemble all, the, all that code to figure out why that was happening. So all plans are good, but test it. Test, test, test. But these DR tests, uh, or manual, okay? And the beauty about the next one, which I'll go into now, is chaos engineering. This is the whole practice of putting your workloads under some kind of test to figure out what's right or wrong, okay? The whole idea is shift left everything you need to do. Chaos testing can be scripted, okay? Chaos does it, and that's quite important. You put it into your BCDR drills into a release pipeline. So it all can be done. And the beauty, and this is why I'm introducing Chaos Studio, it's, it's fairly new. It's just become GA not so long ago. Built into the, so it's part of the platform. You can use it, enable it. You pick a whole bunch of experiments. So you put faults, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip this and I'll go straight to this one so you understand what it is. You make a hypothesis, then you create the experiment against particular faults. So you inject faults, service bus going down, a VNet, the NSGs of the VNet are, are all blocked, so there's no outbound traffic. Keep going, and, and you run it. And then monitoring, it's important to monitor. You need to know if your application has failed. If you're not doing it, then what will happen? You'll be none the wiser and you'll be the person at two o'clock in the morning being woken up by an SMS or a phone message. Please check. So you need this. So it's not just monitoring. You need the alerting. You need to, you know, you're monitoring it so you know something is not being met. You need to monitor it. But also, you'll see in the Azure portal, we will provide you any alerts that have happened to us through, because you'll get maintenance events and alert events come to it. So subscribe to them, free charge, come and subscribe to them. So what you will happen is you get a whole bunch of information of what's happening. So you're well aware of it. Now, that's all the theory. You need to go and do one thing. This is my, my takeaway. There's an architecture review available at our website. It's one of the assessments and you get to pick which pillars you want to do. And what I've been talking about is one of them and it has a whole bunch of questions you go through. In question, answer, question, answer. And at the end, you'll get a score and a action plan of how to improve your application. That's important. 
Okay, so you can ask for me to come and do this, and I'll sit there with the same questions. I'll go through the same set of questions, look at your architecture, and, and help you design that. But as a first stage, if you're truly looking at well architected, and so, or as I called it, reliably well architected, do the review. Find out where your failures are, as in your breaking points of your application, and work through it. As I've been told, I'm at time. Thank you. Okay, a whole bunch of, I know this is a brain dump, too much information. Thank you. And um, I'll open up to the floor for any questions. Thank you.